We are starting the postpartum lecture, critical thinking and nursing process of the postpartum client. Let's go next. So as you can see here on the slide where it says postpartum equals full service care, we are talking about everything, okay? Um, the postpartum period is an extremely important one because of the possibilities, again, of uterine hemorrhage. It is such a um, focused assessment that we're going to do with that uterus to make sure that that uterus is not going to hemorrhage. So it is an important um, part, an extremely important part, um, because of the possibility of that uterine hemorrhage again and because of the optimal period for that parent-child bonding, okay, that maternal bonding as well. So it is a postpartum is full service care. We're going to talk about all of these that you see on the slide. You follow up the uterus, the lochia, the legs, um, the elimination, the rest of vaginal area in, um, interventions, education, caring, attachments, all of this. Um, for discharge from the hospital, usually the patients will get discharged 48 hours for a vaginal delivery and 72 hours for a C-section. Now here is postpartum vaginal care, okay? Um, we are going to talk throughout this lecture about the postpartum physiologic changes, so we will touch up on all of these um, individually, okay? Um, just want to mention, since we're on the slide of postpartum care and vaginal delivery, that we do assess the vital signs, the fundus checks, the locia checks, Fisiotomy, bonding, rest, nutrition, um, also at the bedside. And I did talk about this when we talked about the first, the fourth stage of labor, which is the first to the fourth hour, one to four hours postpartum. Okay, we talked about that self administered kit that's at the bedside. Okay, and I will tell you again that um, mom has a vaginal delivery and she is, as soon as she's delivered and we've done her. We 15 minutes, we'll do her vital signs for the first hour, and we are checking fundus, the lochia, okay, all of the above. We are going to get her that self-administered um, medicated kit. She can do her, she can take herself. We'll put it at the bedside. And again, it will contain the ibuprofen, which is about 200 milligrams. She could take up to three tabs PO every six to eight hours, and that's going to be PRN. And then Tylenol, acetaminophen. 500 milligram tabs times two tabs PO every four to six hours PRN and also colase okay 100 milligrams times two tabs PRN for constipation so we want to keep her um, pain free but we don't want her to take any narcotics so ibuprofen Tylenol um, should be able to do it okay and then to keep her stool soft so she's not straining to go to the bathroom since we know that maybe she spend um, a little bit of time trying to deliver this baby, and with a C-section because she's got stitches, we want to make sure that we're going to give her coli so that it's easier for her to have a bowel movement. Same with a postpartum C-section, a little bit different, okay? Um, we're still going to assess vital signs, but we're going to assess that post-anesthesia state, the oxygen status because she did go to surgery, okay, the eyes and nose, um, now, of course, because mom's had a section, okay, she's had anesthesia to get this baby out, to have this baby, um, she's going to have a Foley to gravity that's usually going to be DC to after 12 hours. Okay, so, you know, postpartum after 12 hours, she'll have that Foley um, DC. And then fundus checks, okay. Um, fundus checks, she'll stay. She'll have her normal saline, 500 cc's with 30 units of Pitocin. That's going to run at 120 cc's an hour. And then we'll do lactated ringers at about 125 cc's an hour, okay? And this is this is Pitocin, this is funded check. So this is Pitocin that's gonna run, okay? And then we'll convert that to lactated ringers at 125 cc's an hour. And then we'll hep lock mom when she's tolerating PO fluids, okay? We'll hep lock it. And then, of course, because she has been to surgery, we're going to maintain that IV access for 24 hours, okay? Um, with her lochia checks, 
we're still going to obviously do look at checks on both moms, but a little different with C-section because she's been to surgery. We're going to go ahead and just like the vaginal delivery mom, first hour um, after birth, okay, those first hours after birth, we're going to do fundus checks um, every 15 minutes for the first hour, okay? So the first hour after birth, we're going to do fundus checks every 15 minutes. So we're going to do every 50, we're going to do low kit fundus checks every 15 minutes for the first hour, every hour thereafter for four hours. And then once she'll go into the postpartum unit, we'll do every eight hours until delivery. Okay. Um, when we're doing low kit checks, and we will talk about this again, but since we have the slide in front of us, I'm going to talk about it now as well. We're going to remove the peroneal pad. Okay, the pad. And we're going to evaluate the lochia. So when we do the lochia checks, we want to look for the color. We're going to see the color, the character, the amount, the odor, okay, um, and for presence of clots. Of course, it's a C-section, so we'll look at incision and dressing. Bonding is very important, that relationship that baby has with that mom, okay? Um, maybe with the partner, the significant other, the baby's um dad that's in the room as well rest nutrition is very important and of course because it's a c-section and she went to surgery and now of course she's got the anesthesia she's got to wait a little we're going to get her up and walking as fast as we can but we've got to get she had an epidural we're going to get that sensation back in her legs um cough and deep breathe every two hours while she's awake for 24 hours Okay, so don't forget the incentive spirometer every two hours. Don't forget the coughing and deep breathing every two hours while she's awake for 24 hours. Um, then we're going to have mnemonic stockings on her until she's ambulating. Okay, and we're going to document eyes and nose until that IV is DC'd and until the she voids for at least two times. Okay, so don't forget to document the eyes and nose until that IV is DC'd and she's voided two times, okay? So obviously her Foley is going to be out. <laughs> her IV will be out and then she'll void for two times. And then we don't have to document eyes and nose anymore. And then we're going to start with our postpartum picture. Um, and then we're going to start with our postpartum physiologic changes. So you could see how we've been talking about how this baby in utero is pushing everything up. Okay. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is vital signs. There's a temperature increased in the first 24 hours. Okay. And that's normal. That's normal physiologic change. After the 24 hours, and, and what I'm talking about a temperature increase, I'm talking about 100.4. Okay. And that's normal. But after those 24 hours, that temperature, that patient should be afebrile. Okay, so that temperature should not be up anymore. The pulse is decreased because remember we talked about how the pulse is increased during pregnancy. Okay, at least um, 15 beats per minute higher. Now that pulse is starting to get decreased. Okay, so it's going to go, you know, to her norm again. Um, if we still have a pulse of more than 100 beats per minute, then we have to check mom for hypovolemia because remember she's got lochia. So we have to check her for hypovolemia maybe dehydration, maybe there is some blood loss. So we've got to make sure that mom is drinking every hour on the hour, at least a little cup of water, an eight ounce, little, little styrofoam cup. She's got to be drinking every hour on the hour, especially if she's also breastfeeding. And if she, even if she's not breastfeeding, she's letting the, the uterus is cleaning out. So she's got all this lochia that's leaving her system. And we've got to make sure that she is well hydrated. Those blood pressure um, pre-birth, uh, pre okay, pre-pregnancy levels usually start to come back to normal with pre-birth levels by like that fourth postpartum day, okay? You can also watch out for orthostatic hypertension, okay, especially if she's, because she's, especially if she's hemorrhaging or she's got a lot of blood loss, that lochia. If she gets dizzy, if she gets tacky, if there's excessive blood loss, if there's inadequate fluid intake, she can start to have that orthostatic hypotension. So that's why your assessment is ideal um, in these mamas, especially when you get them in fresh um, to the postpartum unit. Okay, um, 
breast, first and second day, it's uh, that breast is going to secrete colostrum. Okay, and just a picture of um, a breast when they become engorged. The third and fourth day, the, the milk is filling in, the filling milk forms within the breast ducts. Then after that fourth day that mom is postpartum, those breasts may become engorged. So just like the Adam, Adam is a great resource um, for pictures. Just like the resource after fourth day, um, they can get taut, they can get shiny, they can look enlarged. Um, your book briefly goes through what a lot of the uh, lactation consultants and all of the floors in the postpartum units, um, they keep frozen cabbage leaves and they're really good. It's homeopathic. You can put them on 15 minutes on, 45 minutes off. Great relief for engorgement, okay, for that pounding sensation in that breast. Um, relief also could be, a, you know, breast binder, like a tight bra to support. Always, um, we always encourage the moms when they come in to deliver, one of the things that you want to bring to the hospital is a bra, okay, a supportive bra. Um, ice packs are, are also good. Okay, because they have natural anti-inflammatory and an analgesic. Okay, now right before mom is going to breastfeed again, whether that's two, two and a half hours after mom is going, when she's getting ready to breastfeed again, we want to do warm compresses. Okay, um, and that way it'll help that milk, okay, come down. Um, but then she can do her frozen cabbage leaves when she becomes engorged. 15 minutes on, 45 minutes off. And that's for that pounding sensation. But right before she goes to breastfeed, those warm compresses are ideal. Another visual picture is we're going to talk about the uterus. Okay, nice little uterus over here, non-pregnant. But remember all of this, all this lining gets thinner, all this baby and everything pushes up. Okay, as you can see, the bladder sits right under. Okay, the bladder is supposed to sit right under that uterus, okay? So talk about the uterus. We'll talk about that famous involution process that is the reduction back to pre-pregnancy state that the uterus has to go through. You've heard me talk about involution. When you go in for your skills day at school, um, we will talk about postpartum. You will get to we'll talk again about this so that it makes um, more and more sense to everybody. We're reinforcing information, um, so you'll hear involution again, okay? And your slide just tells you after birth, um, you know, the, the uterus is usually between the symphysis pubis, which is at the bottom, and there's a, do a picture again, that we showed this picture, same when Juan was in the fourth stage of labor um, after she had just delivered fresh and we were assessing the uterus. So always make sure one hand is on the symphysis pubis, okay? You never want to palpate a uterus without supporting the lower segment, okay? This lower segment right here by the symphysis pubis, okay? So one hand is going to go right above the symphysis pubis, and the other hand is going to be at the umbilicus, okay? And then this right hand that's going to be at the umbilicus is going to press in and downward, okay, within the hand and the umbilicus until you bump, okay, until you bump against a firm globular mass in the abdomen, okay, and that's going to be, okay, the top of the uterus and then right at the symphysis pubis, okay, and then we want to see the height where that uterus is at, okay, and of course, again, how we chart it, we'll do two finger breaths below the umbilicus for every postpartum day. So if you have a fresh mom, we'll go back to the, the, the slide. If you have a fresh mom that just came in, again, after birth, right after birth, you're between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. Okay, that's where that uterus is at. And then one hour after birth, it's going to go right at the umbilicus. And then 24 hours after, you're going to see the one to two finger breaths Okay, below the umbilicus for every postpartum day. So a fresh mom can be right on the umbilicus, which is right where you want that to be. And then with every day that she is there, okay, it's one to two finger breaths below the umbilicus. And it takes about seven to nine days for that uterus to involute, to come fully back to pre-pregnancy state. And again, how is that fundal height assessed? We have 
we'll just turn into pictures again with the involution process. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that the location is a midline. The height, we do it in finger breadth. So these are centimeters. So it's a finger breadth. And then the firmness, the consistency. Is it firm? Is it soft? Is it boggy? And if it's not firm and it's not midline and it's, you know, to the side, it feels like it's to the side, um, a little displaced, mom probably has a full bladder. And we need to make sure that before we do a fundal check that we make sure mom has an empty bladder, okay, before, before we actually do that. Um, and we want to make sure that it's firm. Now, if it's boggy, we want to make sure we do a firm fundal massage. Maybe there's a clot or two that will come out so that to remind that uterus that it needs to continue to contract, okay, so that it goes back to pre-pregnancy state. Okay, so those first few days postpartum are very, very important. Um, especially if she's a fresh mom that comes in because we know of the biggest risk postpartum after that mom delivers is the uterus. It's that focused assessment. It's the uterus. We want to make sure that it con continues to contract, which are the after pains, which is this process of involution to come back to pre-pregnancy state. And it needs to be firm. It needs to be midline. Okay. Um, and it needs to be involuting one to two finger breaths below the umbilicus for every postpartum day. And then lochia. Okay, the lochia is that uterine flow consisting of blood, decidua, white blood cells, bacteria. As a placenta is separating from the endometrium, this is all the sloughing off of everything to get that uterus nice and clean again. All that sloughing off is in the lochia, okay? Lochia is measured according to the amount. Okay, so red is rubra, one to three days um, postpartum. These are like heavy menses. And then you get from pink to serosanguinous, and that's the serosa. Okay, and this is about, I put um, about three um, days. Okay, it could happen the third day, it could happen the fourth day, all the way to 10 days, pretty, you know, give or take. And then you've got al alba, the white to yellow, it takes about 10 days. It may last up to six weeks. Okay, um, the pad that mom has on, we should be able to change her pad every three hours. Okay, so every three hours she takes care of baby. She's either breastfeeding or bottle feeding and mama takes care of her. Okay, she will um, wash her bottom. Okay, we have little bottles of water in the hospitals that she can wash from front to back. She can pat dry. Okay, and then what we are going to do for her is we are going to, um, she's going to get her pad, okay, so we have these really fancy underwears at the hospital that we can give her, they're really big and they look like, like a little um, mesh, okay, right after she delivers, and we put a big pad on, um, and we'll wipe from front to back, and then we'll teach her how to do that the first time that she gets up, and she can wipe from front to back to the water, um, pat dry, and then she can go ahead and put the pad on. Then she can put on, um, depending on when she's delivered and how uncomfortable she's been. And we did talk about this in labor and delivery as well. And when we were doing the assessment, the first four hours, but I'm reminding you again, since we're talking about lochia, um, reminding you again, and then the next one is perineum. So just want to remind you again. Um, so when she's changing and she's taking care of herself, we'll go into our perineum, loica checks, perineum, and she's taking care of herself. We are change, changing her pad, giving her the little water bottle. She can put it on from front to back. She can wipe, um, so pat dry, okay, from front to back. And then she can go ahead and change the pad. Then we can go ahead and, and she can put on a pad that's called a witch hazel. Okay, um, she can put it on. It's a little round. It's round and it looks like a, a wipe, a baby wipe. But instead of being square and long, it's just a round little um, wipe. She can put it on that witch hazel and that helps, um, has witch hazel. So it helps with her bottom um, to, if she's got hemorrhoids, it'll help her. If she's got a little a bruising and ecchymosis, that will help her too. And then we could do um, dermaplast. 
okay, or Epifoam or Dermaplast. It has a little bit of lidocaine and it will help mom in her bottom if she has a tear, if she has an episiotomy. She took a long time delivering, okay? So every three hours she can take, mama takes care of her and then she can take care of baby, changes diaper, feeds baby, and then mama takes care of her perineum, okay? Her hygiene is very, very important to save her from having a big infection, okay? So pad, okay, perineal pad, um, we could do a witch hazel pad, a little, a little um, witch hazel, okay? Um, a little pad, a little round uh, pad, and then we can go ahead and put Epifoam or Dermaplast, whichever pharmaceutical company that hospital has. And then she can put it on her, and every three hours she can change, okay? So the soaking um, through a pad every hour, that means that she's losing more than the average amount of blood. So she shouldn't be soaking her pads every hour. She should That pad that she has on should last her for at least three hours, okay? Then moving, then continuing on here with her perineum is, yes, her bottom. So tissue swelling, that's going to be normal. It's going to be tender. She's going to have some ecchymosis. Now, how do we check mom's bottom, okay? Is we want to make sure when we're going to do a perineum assessment, there are flashlights in postpartum units. Please use them. You check laying on her side, okay, and we're going to flex her upper leg. Laying on the side and flexing her upper leg. Okay, Kegel exercises are really important. They improve muscle tone. Um, we do the perineal care. And then the labia majora and the labia minora are going to remain atrophy. They're soft. Um, Good for circulation, good for vasodilation. Again, those witch hazel, um, those, and they're also, they're called tucks, um, little pads, little round pads. So that's witch hazel. It has witch hazel, or there's a tucks. And then the epifoam or the dermaplast, and that's what has that lidocaine that we can put in her bottom. Also, if she's got hemorrhoids from all of the um, laboring that she did with um, through the delivery, then we can give her some anti-hemorrhoidal cream like Anusol, for example, a 2.5% cream um, four times a day every six hours. Excuse me. Um, Anusol, 2.5% cream um, four times a day every six hours, or Anusol, 1% um, suppository, BID, um, you know, PRN as needed. We could do it every 12 hours. Okay, so twice a day, BAD every 12 hours. Um, she probably wants to stay away from the suppositories at the at first. Um, so we can do the cream at the very beginning. Okay, so then we're going to talk about GI system. <clears throat> um, if she does have hemorrhoids, okay, we will assess those. Um, due to relaxin. Her bowels may be sluggish. And remember, that's the hormone that relaxes the ligament cartilage, cartilage. So some nursing considerations to prevent and treat constipation. Um, because, you know, pain from the episiotomy or the hemorrhoids may cause her to hinder those bowel movements. So we want to make sure she's ambulating, she's drinking fluids, at least six to eight glasses, those little styrofoam glasses, um, in the hospital, and then when she goes home, a glass, a regular eight ounce glass of water a day. So six to eight of those. Um, she can drink apple juice. Now, apple juice contains sorbitol. And sorbitol is a natural sugar with laxative um, properties. Of course, trying to eat as healthy as she can to get this GI system back working. Fruits, veggies, whole grains, bread, stool softeners. That's why we're giving her the colace. Remember that self-medicated um, okay, kit. Um, that's why we're giving her the stool softeners and, of course, the suppositories okay, um, for the hemorrhoids. And if she hasn't been able to have a bowel movement, okay, after her two or three days, let's say she had a C-section, she hasn't been able to do a bowel movement, and she's going home, you can alleviate to make sure that she is going, um, you don't want to discharge her so uncomfortable. We could do even maybe a, a half, a, like a sliver. We can slice it um, and we can give her a glycerin suppository, okay? And see if she can go to the, re to the bathroom, have a bowel movement this way before she is discharged, okay? 
Now the stool softeners are really important because we want to avoid her bearing down, okay, to have a bowel movement because that's going to can produce breakdown of her healing sutures. Um, even if she had an episiotomy, if she delivered a vaginal or if she had a C-section, okay? So straining is not a good thing. So we want to keep her from doing that. Then GU, okay, and those are obviously pictures of hemorrhoids. So those little things that you see are very uncomfortable. And sometimes moms will say, you know, this is what was much more uncomfortable for me than even the episiotomy, okay? And that's why we want to put that tux, which is the witch hazel, which is anti-inflammatory, which is the witch hazel, and it's going to help with the hemorrhoids. The GU system, so immediately postpartum, there's a trace in proteinuria, and then that diuresis will begin 12 hours after delivery, okay, to one week, and actually it counts for like five pounds of a weight loss. And then, of course, diuresis is a result of aldosterone production and also decrease in sodium retention. And you could see the swollen legs here um, since she was about 33 weeks pregnant. Okay. But then she delivers and that diuresing process will start. Okay. Now the skin. So we're, we're actually doing um, pretty much a head to toe with the postpartum. Okay. And all these normal physiologic changes that are happening. So usually about a week after mom delivers, she's going to experience muscle aches, strains as a result of all that exert, you know, exertion that she's done during labor. So stray out with your stretch marks. Okay, that's all part of the integumentary system. They're going to appear a little bit more reddened, more prominent. They will fade into pale white or darker pigmentation, um, you know, uh, depending, okay, that hyperpigmentation of the skin. Um, and that's the, the linea negra, that's a black line, okay? That will eventually um, disappear. White line will disappear. We said it um, as postpartum hormone levels peak down, and that will start to disappear. And then the cloasma is that excessive hyperpigmentation um, on the face and the neck. And that's what the effects of estrogen and progesterone that has happened throughout the pregnancy. So as those levels climb down, um, mom will have less and less of that showing. Um, it may persist in some moms because they're taking birth control pills and they do have the hormones. Okay. Just want to show you what stretch marks look like. This is at 38 weeks when this mom was pregnant. You could see all the stretching. Okay. And then two days postpartum, how they kind of turn into that pale white, oops, pale white or like a darker pigmentation. Okay, and then of course the black line, okay, in relationship to how big the baby is in utero, so 20 weeks, 22, 24 as it grows, okay, up to the fundus, and then the chlasma. Okay, so a little bit on postpartum psychological changes, okay. So these psychological changes, there's factors that influence adaptation to parenthood, okay? We know that becoming a parent creates a period of change, um, a period of stability for men and women who decide to have children. Um, factors. Age is a factor. Culture is a factor. Socioeconomic levels are factors. Um, expectations of what that child would be like. It's also factors, okay, that influence the adaptation to parenthood. And Reba Rubin um, was a nursing theorist, okay? She identified phases that postpartum women go through in the process of them identifying themselves um, as a mother, okay? And that taking in phase, it's that dependent phase, the phase that they're still excited, they're talkative. They have a desire to review the birth experience. Then there is a dependent independent, which is the taking hold phase. This is a phase that lasts about three to 10 days. This is about mom already starting to take charge. And you will see this. And then there's this interdependent phase, which is that letting go phase. 
which usually last about 10 days to six weeks, okay? Um, also in the 80s, she did, um, she, another, again, Ramona Mercer, another nursing theorist, um, did maternal role attainment. And she said that the process can start, the process of being a mom can start before birth. And it could last for three to 10 months um, after birth, okay? And this is how the mom learns mothering behaviors. And she went ahead and she talked about anticipatory stage. When that mom looks for examples to follow, that's during pregnancy, okay? That could be from a sister, that could be from her grandma, that could be from a best friend, okay? Anybody that's close to mom, she's going to look for examples to follow. And then there's that formal stage where the mom acts as others expect her to act. And that's usually postpartum, and that's usually after postpartum for about six to eight weeks. And then she goes, and that's when she says, yes, yes, and she takes it all in, everybody's saying, burp the baby this way, yes, yes. And then she starts to figure out different ways of doing it herself, okay? That's why getting all this, um, her activities of daily living organized, living organized with a routine, um, it takes a couple of weeks, okay, six to eight weeks. And then she starts to go into this informal stage where mom develops her own style. Okay, now she's going to begin to make her own choices. And then it's that personal stage. Mom is comfortable with herself as being a mom. Okay, and most moms usually achieve this by like four months. Sometimes it takes some moms a little longer, but usually they achieve this for about four months. And also in the 2000s, um, again, there is that process of becoming a mom, according to Ramona Mercer. And she did replace this with her theory um, from the 1980s. And she said, you know, it is a process of becoming a mom. Um, how, you becoming mom how you become a mom has new skills. There's an increased confidence in yourself. And this is going to happen as that new mom meets new challenges in caring for her child or her children. And then she went ahead and she said, these are going to be um, in stages. And she went through the commitment stage, which is attachment to the unborn baby. Then she said there's an acquaintance stage where there's the attachment, but then you're learning to care for that infant. And then there's this new normal stage of now it's my baby and me. This is the new normal. It's not just me anymore. And then you've got the final stage, which is that maternal identity stage, which is redefining you know, herself to incorporate motherhood, okay? And then we have engrossment. We have to leave something, um, you know, for the boys. We talk about mom all of the time, so we have to leave something for the boys. And this is that father's absorption, that preoccupation, that interest in the infant. Um, you know, great, great to see that when you see that in the labor room. And then... About 80% of American women go through something called postpartum blues, okay? This is usually um, postpartum could be the first day to about two weeks of mom delivering where she feels um, she's got feelings of, you know, emotional, she's crying, she doesn't, um, she's crying, she doesn't understand why, um, she's got difficulty concentrating, she's irritable, She's tearful, she's anxious, she's fatigued, she's um, sleep disturbed. You know, this is this stage of postpartum blues. This is normal, this is temporary, and this is self limiting. Okay, this is a state that will generally pass within two weeks from delivery. Okay, there's a there's some coping. Okay, and it seems like it's it's yes, I know that, but when you're going through this and you're overwhelmed, and like to like this mom that we're seeing that has a little two-year-old or three-year-old and now has a newborn, and is home by herself, and she's trying to do all of this, you know, coping, just the little things that will help her, like rest, you know, when the baby sleeps, take a nap, um, you know, you want them to get, get help, okay, you're not super mom, if she's breastfeeding, she's got to be patient, um, they'll, you know, will recommend her doing something for herself, going for a walk, okay? 
plan a day out of the house, maybe, um, you know, a mom with her baby. I know here now, in the now, in the 2000, you know, 2020, we've got COVID, but there's, you know, malls that you can go with your baby. Um, you could still go and eat with your friends. Um, if you have, you know, everybody will offer the help and sometimes the moms won't get the help because they think they're super mom, but then they're overwhelmed, they're anxious. So get the help, you know, and leave the baby for a couple hours. Okay. There's also community resources that are wonderful for breastfeeding and they're called La Leche League. L-A-L-E-C-H-E, La Leche League. They are wonderful and they will sit on the phone with you. They will help you. Um, they're on obviously online and they've got community mental health services they can refer you to as well. Um, as we go into from postpartum blues to becoming a postpartum, to becoming a postpartum um, depression, there is that postpartum support international. So it's www.postpartum.net. Um, and this, you know, it tells you that mom's experiencing depression or anxiety. This is a great referral for them for postpartum depression because this could be a tremendous stressful time for a family. Okay. Um, and, you know, many factors are involved in a difficult postpartum adjustment um, period. Um, again, we went through that, you know, sleep deprivation, financial stress, grieving over an unexpectedly difficult birth traumatic family history, high expectations of the mom. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on, but there is support out there for moms, okay? And, you know, my recommendation is always when we do postpartum, we, we do discharge from postpartum, um, we give her a list of resources we give her the phone number. If you need anything, call us. And that's always good because that's that connection that she's got to, let's say, the hospital, the nursing unit, so that there's somebody that she can actually call. And then we can talk to her on the phone. We can tell her. We will say, do you have somebody you can call to pick up the baby, to be with you, to give, you know, to offer you some help? Um, so that is 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 the best that we could do for them. And every time that we discharge them, we will talk to them. We will make sure that she's going home with support, that she has support. That's where our assessment skills come in. And that is also where our social, her wonderful social workers come in. Okay. Because if she doesn't have the support at home, they will work on getting her support. Okay. And giving her different, different ways to deal with, um, with getting her support. Okay. Um, and then, of course, this is your postpartum assessment. It's pretty much what we just went through, focused postpartum assessment. Okay. And then breastfeeding. Can't can't do postpartum without doing breastfeeding because breastfeeding is all this baby needs for the first six months of life. We've got colostrum. Colostrum is a natural laxative. It's got protein. It's got immunoglobulins. And it's all this baby needs. So even when mom starts breastfeeding this baby and it's thin and it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot. It's colostrum and it is fin and it is what the baby needs. Okay. And then of course the milk comes in and then you can start breastfeeding. Now, if mom is not breastfeeding, menstruation will begin in about six to 10 weeks. Okay. And if she's breastfeeding, menstruation usually begins in about three to four months. Sometimes it even takes longer if she still continues to breastfeed. Okay, so if she's not breastfeeding, she'll get her, her, her cycle back in about six to 10 weeks. And one thing I do want to mention and remind um, patients when they're breastfeeding is that it is not a form of birth control, uh, of birth control. Um, not a form of birth control. So um, we'd like to see her back. But we don't want to see her back so quickly that um, she's going to get pregnant right away again. Okay, so just to keep in mind that once a placenta is delivered, the effects of estrogen and progesterone are no longer inhibit that follicular stimulating hormone. So what happens? Ovulation begins. Okay, 
So if mom is not breastfeeding, menstruation usually begins in six to 10 weeks. So it's great um, education to tell mom. And if breastfeeding menstruation begins, um, may return about three to four months or sometimes may take even longer. So a little bit on breastfeeding, you have the slides, proper breastfeeding positions, lat latching on. We've got our wonderful lactation consultants in the unit that we um, will use, will work with mom to get her to breastfeed, to get her to relax and breastfeed. And there's different um, positions that we can have mom to breastfeed as well. And this mom is holding this baby, but if they fall asleep, you can take the little onesie off, just leave the baby with their diaper, you can have them breastfeed. Now you don't wanna suck on the nipple. You have to suck on the areola, okay? So that you don't get that nipple breakdown. Some key points, and they're there for you on the slide. Um, we provide teaching and counseling to promote that women's feeling of competence and self-care and baby care. Um, nursing plan of care includes assessments, comfort measures, and safety measures. Um, common nursing interventions, evaluating and treating the boggy uterus and the full urinary bladder. We provide for pharmacological and non-pharmacological relief of pain and discomfort associated with that episiotomy and that laceration. And then of course we institute measures to promote or suppress um, lactation. And if mom does not want to breastfeed, she's gonna leave those breasts alone, okay? Um, we She can wear a binder, she can wear a bra. Okay, when she showers, um, try to avoid that hot water on her breast because then she'll again start to leak so maybe a um not put warm bra um, water on her breast when she's showering and just leave the breast alone okay and eventually she will dry up okay and she will start to leak the the milk we don't give anything else to mom we tell her to support her breast wear a, a, a bra a binder okay a bra supportive bra and we leave them alone and meeting psychosocial needs of new moms involves planning care that's going to consider the composition and functioning of that entire family. Okay. Effective means to prevent crisis and facilitate physiologic and psychologic adjustments are used in combination. And there could be, um, you know, follow up visits. And right now with COVID, that's a little bit more challenging, but we could, you know, do, you'll see um, follow up visits, you'll see a telephone follow-up support groups, referrals to community resources, and the hospital is great in the discharge planning, promoting, okay, um, facilitating, okay, for physiologic and psychological adjustments for mom. Okay, well, thank you for watching. Okay, thank you for listening, watching to your slides, listening to your postpartum lecture.